On the 7th of July 2005, London was hit by a series of explosions. You probably think you know what happened that morning, but you don't. This film is an attempt to refute the central conspiracy theory regarding the event. The conspiracy theory presented to us by the police, the government and the media. Because that is all the official story is. A conspiracy theory. In case you don't know it, here it is. They then made the short walk to the underground station where, at around 8.30am, they split up and each headed off to separate trains. Three of the men blew themselves up almost simultaneously at 8.50am. The fourth, Hasib Hussain, apparently unable to board a train, left the underground, bought a battery in WH Smith, briefly visited McDonald's, then got on a number 30 bus and triggered his bomb at 9 One thing that is clear is the terrible loss of life. And yet, despite demands from the Muslim community, the families of the victims and the victim support group, Tony Blair and the Labour government have obstinately rejected calls for a full, independent public inquiry. would take too much time, cost too much money and divert resources away from the war on terrorism. Tony Blair assured us that all our questions would be answered by this narrative. On December the 14th he said, I do accept that the people want to know exactly what happened and we will make sure that they do. And he said, we will publish a full account of all the information we have. And he pledged, we will bring together all the evidence that we have and publish it, so that the people, the victims and others, can see exactly what happened. Well Tony, the narrative has now been published does not tell us exactly what happened. It is not a full account of all the information you have, and it certainly is not all the evidence. So did you mean what you said? Or were those promises just more politically expedient lies? Let's take a look at the official narrative released by the Home Office on May the 11th, 2006. One thing that's immediately clear is that the author has not seen the raw source material for much of the evidence he cites. What we're being offered is at best second-hand information, at worst, deceptive hearsay. Although the mainstream media have strangely refused to properly analyse the contents of the narrative, most of the issues raised by this document have been covered efficiently by the alternative media, so we will not go into detail about the items of interest that the narrative glosses over, or conveniently does not mention at all. Like the fact that identifying documentation for Mohammed Sadiq Khan was, for some reason, found at three out of the four bomb sites. Or the issue of what explosives were used, something that, incredibly, is described in the narrative as still under expert examination more than a year after the attacks. Or the fake Al-Qaeda confession, 
released on the internet a few hours after the attacks through a server in Texas. Or the training exercises taking place in London that day, based on a scenario of bombs going off at the exact same times at the exact same stations as the attacks occurred. So we had to suddenly switch an exercise from fictional to real. Or the huge amount of money made in speculating the rise and fall of sterling, the result of either full knowledge of the event or extraordinary luck. Or the arrest of Haroon Aswat, widely reported by the UK media as being the mastermind behind the attacks, and by the US media as being an agent for MI5. Or the strange mistake regarding the time of the train taken by the men from Luton that morning. The police, the press and the government narrative all reported that the men took the 740 departure, but as discovered by bloggers and the alternative media, the 740 was cancelled that day. Instead, we will focus on the list of key evidence specifically cited in the narrative. DNA identified the four at separate bomb sites and damage to bodies suggests they were close to bombs. Three of the men have been forensically linked to the bomb factory in Leeds. The car in which they travelled contained explosive devices. The four were identified on CCTV at various points on their journey. Witness accounts suggest two of the men were fiddling in their rucksacks. There is no evidence of remote detonation at the bomb sites. There is a video statement by Khan. Khan also left a last will and testament indicating his desire to martyr himself. Let's go through these in reverse. Like most of the evidence reported to condemn these four men, Khan's will and testament has never been shown to the public and has therefore never been scrutinised or confirmed to be real. Khan's video confession makes no actual reference to him blowing himself up. It's said by people who knew him to show him several years ago and has never been shown in its entirety. Since the narrative's release, we've also seen a video by Shazad Tanweer. Again, Tanweer makes no reference to his suicide and we have never seen the whole film. Even if these videos are genuine, they are not evidence that the men were responsible for the London bombings. If there is no evidence of remote detonation at the bomb sites, why did the New York police, based on what the British police had told them, report at a conference that the bombs were set off using mobile phones, the same remote timing devices used in the Madrid bombings in 2004? The eyewitness accounts of the bombers fiddling with their rucksacks are extremely dubious. The first, reported widely across the international press soon after the attack, came from a Mr Richard Jones, who claims to have seen a man fiddling with his bag on the bottom floor of the number 30 bus. He described the man he saw as clean-shaven and wearing light brown trousers and a light brown top, so obviously he wasn't talking about Hussein. The second was Danny Biddle, badly injured in the Edgware Road bomb. Six months after the attacks, he told a newspaper that he had actually seen Khan before he blew himself up. We are not suggesting that Biddle lied, but we are suggesting that someone who is paid to tell their story six months after the event is not a reliable enough witness to be a central piece of evidence in the official government report concerning the attacks. As for the CCTV recordings, where are they? No CCTV footage has been released to the public. All we have seen are three still images. One shows Hussein alone entering the ticket hall at Luton Station, inexplicably cropped so it does not show the other three men who should all be around him. The second shows Hussein, again alone, outside Boots and King's Cross Station, apparently at 9am, ten minutes after he was supposed to be dead and at a time when King's Cross Station was being evacuated. And the third shows four figures entering Luton Station, three of whom have blurred faces, so only Hussein is actually identifiable. There are no images of the four men together in London. In fact, there are no images of any of the train bombers in London that day at all. As the police themselves emphasised, the men should have been filmed by CCTV cameras along the whole route, capturing literally thousands of images of their journey. Or perhaps, like the cameras on the number 30 bus, all those cameras just weren't working that day. The car in which they travelled to Luton is said to have contained explosive devices but it's never been explained why the men would have left them there when embarking on a suicide mission. The devices were reportedly destroyed in controlled explosions. These photos appeared on ABC News in America, but for some reason they were never officially released in the UK. And then there is the forensic and DNA evidence apparently identifying the four men at the bomb sites, which again has never been presented to the public for proper scrutiny. And the fact that the police tell us that they have the evidence, and that it is convincing, unfortunately does not mean that they do, 
or that it is. The past record of the British police in catching and honestly convicting the real perpetrators of bombings in the UK is appalling. Instead, in numerous cases it has been shown that the police deliberately tampered with evidence, forced confessions out of suspects, and withheld information that would clear them. You think we're exaggerating? Then go on the internet and look up the following. with the death of Jean de Menezes in Stockwell Station. Having killed an innocent man for no reason other than they thought he was someone else, who they also should not have killed, they responded to the outcry with a string of lies and deception. And despite all the investigations, no police officer was charged or punished in any way. Then another thing, it is that they are. In the wake of the bombs, Britain has been left a changed nation. Already the country with the most surveillance in the world, the UK is set to move further towards a literal Big Brother society. Tony Blair said at the 2005 Labour Party conference, We know we need strict controls in a changing world. Really, Tony? We know we need strict controls? Exactly who do you mean by we? The British public? The government and police? Or you and your friends? And how exactly are these strict controls going to stop potential terrorists being aggrieved by our foreign policy? And how would these controls have prevented the attacks in London? We have just been fortunate enough to see these strict controls in their true light during the latest terrorist threat, which played out across the UK like an Orwellian pantomime. On the 10th of August, 24 supposed terrorists were arrested. They were allegedly just about to blow up 10 planes in mid-air using liquid explosives, despite the fact they had no bombs, no plane tickets, and several of them didn't even have passports. With the threat apparently foiled, the terrorist alert level immediately went up to critical, indicating that a terrorist attack was still deemed imminent. In response to this insanity, the airports immediately introduced an absurd draconian policy regarding carry-on luggage. No liquids could be carried onto the plane. iPods, phones and even books were banned. And mothers were made to taste their baby milk to prove it wasn't explosive. Thankfully, our Prime Minister managed to depart for his family holiday in the Caribbean before the airport clampdown occurred. As Blair also helpfully explained at the Labour conference, ID cards traditionally resisted by the public, would be introduced. Again, because he says they are necessary in a changing world. But every one of the four alleged 7-7 bombers would have legally had one. So what are they hoping to achieve with them? ID cards will have the same effect on preventing terrorism as license plates have in preventing car crashes. And there's now talk of introducing biometric identification, iris scans and body scanners. 
Who is actually being watched here? The so-called terrorists? Or us? MI5 has boosted its number since the attacks by 25%. The Metropolitan Police has requested funding for an additional 1,500 anti-terrorist police, while police powers have risen considerably. These include the right to detention without trial. The UK is currently the only European nation to have suspended Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which prevents such detention. How can a supposedly free, moral and rational society allow the imprisonment of human beings without having the evidence to actually charge them with wrongdoing? What happened to the concept of innocent until proven guilty? When was it decided that this no longer applied to every one of us, irrespective of race or background? Consider the cases of the following terrorists. Walter Wolfgang. The 82-year-old pensioner removed from the Labour Party conference in September 2005 for heckling Jack Straw and then, after he tried to gain re-entry, detained under the Terrorism Act. 80-year-old John Catt, stopped by police for wearing a t-shirt suggesting that Bush and Blair be tried for war crimes, searched under the Terrorism Act. Sally Cameron, arrested and held for four hours for walking on a cycle path in Dundee under the Terrorism Act. Isabel Ellis Cockcroft, stopped and searched under the Terrorism Act, despite being 11 years old. Ian Blair said in a GMTV interview in February 2005, I don't think people should distinguish crime and terrorism too easily. Think about those words coming from the Chief of Police. I don't think people should distinguish crime and terrorism too easily. In the most extraordinary and draconian expansion of their powers ever seen in the UK, the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act came into power in 2005. The provision you may have heard about in the media was Section 132, the restriction to demonstrate within one kilometre of Parliament Square, obviously an essential tool in fighting organised crime. The first conviction under the Act was in December 2005, after Maya Evans was arrested for reading out the names of British soldiers killed in the Iraq War under the Cenotaph, without permission. Since when was peaceful protest a serious organised crime? But the more important section of the Act, and one that was barely mentioned by the mainstream media, was the changes made to the powers of arrest used by the police. From New Year's Day 2006, the police can now arrest you for any offence at all, including dropping litter, or not wearing a seatbelt. Indeed, according to the actual wording of the Act, the police can even arrest you, quote, to enable the name of the person to be ascertained. If you don't think they would ever actually do that, ask yourself why they would include it in the Act at all, if they were never going to use it. We are constantly told that the terrorists, especially the CIA-created Islamic group Al-Qaeda, are attacking our way of life and our freedom. But these transparently absurd claims are made only by our government, never by the terrorists themselves, who consistently cite very different and very specific grievances. And ironically, it's not the terrorists attacking our way of life, but our own government. Through the expansion of police powers and stringent anti-terrorist measures being imposed upon Britain, they are using our fear for our safety to restrict our liberty and they are using their false promises of security to erode our privacy. This is happening now, and it's happening to every person in the UK. You are not somehow exempt from the regulatory provisions of the new police state being brought into this country. The terrorists cannot take away our freedom or change our way of life. Only our own elected leaders can do that, and they are. If you have examined any of the information released about the attacks of the 7th of July, or if you get your news from a reputable source, i.e. one outside of the mainstream media, then you probably are one of those advocating an inquiry into the London bombings. We suggest you stop wasting your time. Why? Because full public inquiries are not full, and they're not public. These terms are used simply to delude us into thinking that the process of an inquiry is intended to uncover the truth about something. This is simply not the case. Let's recall the last major public inquiry held in the UK. The Hutton Inquiry set up to investigate the apparent suicide of Dr David Kelly 
with a side mandate of examining whether the government manipulated intelligence to facilitate the invasion of Iraq. Given that Hutton was appointed by Lord Faulkner, the very man who continues to declare that the Iraq invasion was somehow legal, it is unsurprising that Hutton absolved Blair and his government of blame. The inquiry refuted allegations that the government had lied about information on Iraq's non-existent weapons of mass destruction, something that any rational person doing an hour of research can see clearly that they did. And more incredulously, Hutton ruled that Dr. David Kelly committed suicide, despite all the physical and medical evidence that clearly points to him having been murdered. But it gets worse. As if public inquiries were already not pointless enough, a recent piece of legislation now guarantees that they will never be anything other than a charade. On June the 7th, 2005, exactly one month before the London bombings, the Inquiries Act became law. Under this new act, any inquiry will be controlled by the relevant government minister who is empowered to block public scrutiny of state actions. This inexplicable change to the way inquiries are run was openly criticised by the Law Society of England and Amnesty International, who stated that the new act means that any inquiry will be controlled by the executive. Obviously the one thing you don't want from a supposedly unbiased investigation. The Canadian judge Peter Corey stated, It seems to me that the proposed new act would make a meaningful inquiry impossible. The commissions would be working in an impossible situation. The minister, the actions of whose ministry was to be reviewed by the public inquiry, would have the authority to thwart the efforts of the inquiry at every step. It really creates an intolerable Alice in Wonderland situation. While the chairman of the US Joint Committee on Human Rights, Congressman Chris Smith, declared that the bill pending before the British Parliament should be named the Public Inquiry's Cover-Up Bill. So if this new act makes inquiries so pointless and so easy to control, the question is why Blair, Clark and the rest of them have seemingly done their best to prevent one happening. We suggest that there will be an inquiry. It will be obstructed from the beginning and it will be controlled by the very people it should be investigating. Be assured it will not be anything approaching a proper investigation. At no point will the inquiry even consider the possibility that the four men labelled as suicide bombers could possibly be innocent or question the lack of evidence against them. It will pass on verbatim the same meaningless, unverifiable assertions made by the police and by the media's anonymous security sources. But it will avoid completely the major contradictions and problems in the official story. They hope at the end of it the public will be satisfied. And the public probably will be. So given that there's never going to be a real investigation determined to actually find rather than hide the truth, what can we do ourselves to uncover the facts? First, demand that the police release the evidence they say they've got. How? File a freedom of information request for the CCTV footage that they claim to have but have never released, and for the vast archive of CCTV images that they have never mentioned but must exist if the men took the journey we've been told they did. There is absolutely no reason for us not to see this CCTV footage, other than it not actually existing. Secondly, write to whatever mainstream media you read or watch and ask them why they have not addressed the verifiable mistruths that they have themselves put out about the attacks. Why they have not questioned the obvious discrepancies in the narrative or the contradictions in the police's presentations of the facts and why they appear to be actively supporting the police and the government over the British public in suppressing information whilst releasing disinformation. And thirdly, write to your Member of Parliament. Ask him if he has read the official narrative and what his views are on the obvious contradictions it contains. Then ask him, as your elected representative, to demand answers from Parliament concerning this attack on the British people. If the official story is right, if the narrative describes the events the way they actually happened, then there is no justification for the police refusing your requests. There is no reason the media would not be properly investigating the details of the official narrative, and there is no reason for your MP to be anything other than open and helpful. But at best their response to you will be polite disinterest. That's if you get a response, and the information requested the evidence crucial for any of us to make an informed judgment about what happened that day 
will not be forthcoming. Don't believe us? Try it. Ask yourself this. Saying there are four bombers, not saying there are four bombers, not saying there are four bombers for miserable events like this. A rational person reviewing the evidence. Then we the British public are entitled to the full weight of evidence concerning these attacks. The media has an unwritten mandate to present the truth in an unbiased manner which they have blatantly ignored. And the police, who are our public servants, and the government, who are our elected employees, are, by definition, required to provide it, whether they want to or not. This is an issue that encompasses the very nature of democracy, the basis of government and the role of the police and the media in our society today.